Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. One of America's most spectacular birds is the sandhill crane. This long-legged bird stands over four feet tall, has a six-foot wingspan, and is a very powerful flyer. The sandhill cranes breed in the northern states and Canada, and they winter in Louisiana, Texas, and California. However, during spring migration, over 100,000 cranes come together in a sort of hourglass pattern, converging on the Platte River of the Great Plains in the state of Nebraska. Here they remain about a month in a sort of staging area before dispersing northward. Lately, the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission has become alarmed at a possible threat to the continued existence of these fine birds. That threat is waterfowl cholera, a disease afflicting in great numbers the white-fronted goose. These large birds also congregate in tremendous flocks at the staging area of the cranes. There is a growing fear that the disease which kills them may also decimate the cranes. Recently, we were invited by the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission to visit the great staging area of the cranes and observe the birds assembled there, as well as to see the important work being done. The area in question is here, along the Platte River in the vicinity of Kearney, Nebraska. That was where we began our observations during what we call a day with the Sandhill Crane. The flight from the small airport at Kearney to our destination has taken only a few short minutes. We're over the remarkable Platte River. A wide and often very shallow stream, its numerous channels are a perfect habitat for cranes in the midst of intensely cultivated prairies. Moving lower, we'll fly above the staging area where so many water birds congregate for a short while. Below us in the shallows are the great flocks of sandhill cranes, resting, feeding, and courting as they wait for spring thaws to unlock the waterways of the North Country before their migration is continued. Our pilot is Doug Benning of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He's now taking us to our landing site nearby. The prairie country here is very flat and so landing a light plane on a meadow presents no particular problems. As had been prearranged, there's one of the game department officials awaiting our arrival, and we'll be doing most of our observations from his jeep today. This landing strip in the meadow is not very far from the river, so it won't take us long to get to where the cranes are. The man who will be guiding us today is a Nebraska Game and Parks Commission wildlife biologist, Jim Hurt, a specialist in fowl cholera. Almost inseparably at Jim's side is a yellow Labrador retriever. A dog is good company during the often solitary sort of work done here at the Platte River. The area where principal research is occurring can be reached in the jeep with ease. We'll soon be where a lot of the sandhill cranes are still coming in from the south. These magnificent birds are fairly good sized, though they give the impression of being larger than they really are. The broad six foot wings and outstretched shape are deceptive because this crane only weighs about eight pounds. They maneuver beautifully, whether in small flights or in large flocks. The stop over here on the plat is really a necessity. They need to feed and rest, because some of these cranes have flown 600 miles nonstop. They will remain here at the Platte River for several weeks, and then abruptly they'll all leave, heading for their nesting grounds much farther north.
The Platte River shallows and adjacent meadows are perfect habitat for sandhill cranes. Here they rest quietly during the day, unless disturbed, at which time they fill the sky impressively in enormous numbers. The low-lying meadows here near the river are water-filled at this time of year from heavy rains, and the birds which come here need this. Half a million or more birds, including waterfowl, stop here each spring, the greater majority being sandhill cranes. This makes the whole Platte River Basin in this part of Nebraska extremely important as a natural habitat, necessary for their survival. But a more immediate concern for the safety of the birds which come to this staging area is what we're studying so closely now, fowl cholera. It's a contagious disease which threatens cranes as well as the other migratory birds which stop here. And thus far, we haven't learned how to control it or even how it spreads. However, birds frequenting the adjacent marshes are more easily exposed to the disease than are those which frequent the river. In this respect, we'll soon be seeing some of those areas where foul cholera research is being conducted. But first, Marlin will take a look at some river locations where the cranes roost. And I'll pick him up later on downstream. While the river is generally shallow, the water in it is very important to the birds. Yet proposed irrigation projects may use so much of it that it would no longer be suitable as a staging area for the cranes. The main channels in the Platte River are deep enough to move along in a canoe quite well, but larger boats would have difficulty. As much as the cranes like this habitat, so too do the Canada and white-fronted geese, which also come here in great numbers. The reason is that surrounding fields are rich with leftover grain from the last harvest. Even though the river is large and wide and clean, disease still threatens. There is good reason to believe foul cholera is most troublesome when the birds are densely masked. The cranes are less exposed to the disease because they have plenty of room to roost in the running water of this important river. Federal and state conservation officials are concerned that it'll become worse than it has been. Both wild and domestic fowl are hit by the disease, but at this time of the year, the most particularly affected are the ducks and geese, and they in turn may expose the sandhill crane. The badger is one of the many small predators here, but it is not affected. Scientists have not ruled out the possibility of foul cholera being transmitted by mammals that may have killed infected birds or eaten diseased carcasses. Still, the most likely means by which the disease is spread is not by small mammals, but rather through the normal process of inhalation, when the birds are in close concentration as occurs here in the Platte River and infected birds are among them. The scientists are certain the disease is carried by crows who feed on the dead carcasses and become infected. Gulls are also suspected. There's another of the small predators common here. It's possible that skunks, too, eat the carcasses of disease-killed birds and thus perhaps may help spread the bacteria. It's time to move on now to the spot where Jim said he'd pick me up again and take a short ride to the marshy pond area where the principal field research is being done on foul cholera.
federal scientists are working closely with Nebraska officials, and Jim Hurt is optimistic. Ahead, two veterinarians from the National Fish and Wildlife Health Lab are gathering and marking geese that they are finding dead of the effects of foul cholera. The man is Dr. Steve Kerr. His colleague is Dr. Sarah Hurley. They found this goose species is hardest hit by foul cholera, so they're studying it most closely. They believe that contaminated dead birds harbor the organism, which may remain infective for at least three months. This species is commonly called the white-fronted goose, but it's also known as the speckle belly. Dr. Kerr will attach a code number to the bird. At intervals of one week for 10 weeks, they'll check both carcass and ground to see how long the bacteria remains in the area. It's important to learn how the disease is transmitted to other birds here. A cage is put over the bird to prevent the test carcass from being carried away by carrion eaters. Perhaps soon their research will begin to answer many of the questions that presently remain unanswered about fowl cholera. It is known that the dead birds contaminate an area. And so, except for the specific test birds that the scientists are using in the field studies, such as the one just marked, all dead birds are collected and incinerated. It's the only feasible means at present to reduce losses. The white-fronted geese, which rest in ponds like this, get their name from the white coloration, which frames the base of its bill. It's a very distinctive marking, and considerably different than the familiar black head and neck and white cheek patches of the Canada goose. This species is the most populous wild goose species in North America. Canada geese seem not to be as susceptible to fowl cholera, but they too can succumb to it. Research may eventually show why they seem more resistant to it than the white-fronted goose, which has been found to constitute 35% of the diseased kill birds here. Nebraska Game and Parks wildlife team Charles Kester and Jerry Cooper use an all-terrain vehicle to search for dead birds. Pond water where a diseased bird is lying may become contaminated with foul cholera bacteria for several weeks. So every effort is made to collect them as soon as possible and take them to incineration areas. The studies have shown that cold, wet weather favors the spread of the disease. We'll move on now to another area where we've been trying an experiment, which may be of benefit to the migrating birds stopping here. One of the problems is a decrease in the amount of surface water available to the birds. Pumping stations like this have been constructed to create new ponds, but the project is costly, and the soils here are so porous that pumps must run constantly to keep the ponds filled. With late afternoon upon us, We've come to a blind near a rather marshy area of the Platte River. This is a favored staging place of the sandhill cranes. It's where they come in small groups from the feeding grounds to assemble and then move off together to the river shallows to roost for the night. This blind is a good observation spot for witnessing the staging activities. Jim has gone on a bit to see if there are some dead geese in the shallows. This is an area where the geese gather during the day when they're not actively feeding 
and he'll need his boots to get where they are. This is one of the areas which Jim checks regularly for carcasses of disease-killed birds. The white-fronted geese rest here in huge flocks, preferring these quieter and more isolated waters of the smaller ponds located in the marshy areas where they're not so exposed. The noise that Jim and his dog make as they slosh along through the water very quickly and not unexpectedly startles the great mass of white-fronted geese into flight. These great flocks mingle so densely that they're prime candidates for foul collar. They're quickly moving out of the area, but the thunder of their passage seems in no way to have bothered another of the small predators of the Platte River Basin, the raccoon. He's right at home here near the marsh where the hunting for frogs and crayfish is easy. As we'd hoped, the sandhill cranes are now beginning to come in toward the staging area. Center stage in this area truly belongs to the cranes. They are spectacular to observe and to hear as they assemble in such numbers in the low grasses. Courtship dances among the sandhill cranes are occurring in many areas. Courting pairs spread and flutter their wings, bow deeply to one another, and do peculiar dancing steps which involve little hops and high leaps into the air, as well as snatching at twigs or pebbles on the ground. Often, the courtship actions of a pair will act as an inspiration to others, and they will join in the display. These spectacular birds are facing many hazards which concerned people are trying to help them overcome. One of the greatest is foul cholera, which has been around for at least 200 years, but man's growing technology may one day eliminate it. That's a goal well worth working toward. Now, with the evening rapidly approaching and the cranes returning here in great numbers, Jim and I pause to simply revel in the beauty that these impressive birds bring to our world and to realize that if they are to survive, steps must be taken to provide for it. The Platte River provides them an absolutely essential stopover place for rest, food, courtship, and migrational regrouping. To prevent extinction, we must preserve this wild river basin habitat for them. Of what value are they? They are poetry on the wing, and the beauty of their very being enriches our world. They're a part of nature's great symphony, and our lives would be less without them. There are many things in nature that are breathtakingly beautiful to experience, 
but surely one of the most stirring among them is spending a day with the Sand Hill Crank. The possibility that waterfowl cholera might attack and virtually decimate the sandhill cranes, which mass in such great numbers at the Platte River each spring, is a very real threat. Only with continued research will conservation scientists be able to eliminate waterfowl cholera, or at least keep it under control among the white-fronted geese, and at the same time diminish the possibility of its being transmitted to the cranes. Such agencies as the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are to be commended for their farsightedness in adopting programs of this nature to help conserve the birds. Only by continuing this concern will we be able to pass on to those who will follow us a healthy and productive wild kingdom.